Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our panel this morning on the best practices for live streaming. Um, I'm excited to have uh, a bunch of great panelists, some, some who I've known and worked with for a while, to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to bring all their knowledge to you. Um, I don't know, they must do hundreds of events between the folks who are up on stage, not even hundreds, maybe, maybe it's even a thousand a year. Um, so th these are folks who are uh, in the trenches making live streams happen every day from big productions to little productions. Um, so we'll, we're going to get a lot of knowledge from them. They, they work on uh, zero budget events probably and some very expensive budget uh, productions. Um, you know, in, in a way, I'd say that technology has clearly changed live production because maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to do a live event, let's say we, to, right now I wanted to do a live event in this room, I, I need fiber lines and satellite trucks and uh, or TV one lines and all this stuff put in, and I would say probably in 30 seconds on my computer I could start a live stream of, of this event right now. I, I could even do it on my phone probably in 30 seconds. Now, I, I don't know if it would be any good or, or the, you know, the quality of the webcam might not be the best, but I, I could do it. But uh, these guys have uh, figured out how to make it better and make it look good. And uh, hopefully the content of this, though, would be worth live streaming. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, so I want to give a little brief introduction of myself and then let the, uh, introduce you to the panelists. Um, uh, my name is John Orlin. I, I've been working for about a year and a half at TechCrunch, the technology blog. Um, and we, I just got back from a week in China where we live streamed an event for a couple days over there. That was, that's a panel in itself. Um, but we, we do live events in New York, San Francisco. Uh, we do mobile live pack coverage at places like CES. Um, and uh, I'll just say, but before that, I worked at CNN for many years and also uh, Yahoo Studios, I, I co-founded. But let me introduce, uh, for, for a quick little introduction from our panelists, uh, we'll start with Dylan. Hi, I'm uh, Dylan Armajani. I work at AOL. I've been there about the last year. And pretty much every live production that goes through AOL or HuffPo, uh, I have my hands on it in some way, from uh, you know, guiding the production to figuring out what technology we're going to use to stream it based on the budget and uh, you know, what kind of redundancy they need. Um, and so you know, we really do a lot of different kinds of events, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit later, but uh, that's me. OK, Alden. My name is Alden Fertig. I'm the product manager for broadcasting at Ustream. And uh, we have anywhere between 100,000 and 500,000 people that are usually streaming using our platform every month and from everything from their iPhones and Android phones up to uh, you know, satellite downlinks of international events that are getting encoded by uh, encoding facilities. And so one of the things I do is support all those broadcasters at many levels to uh, make sure that we can have uh, everyone stream and have all the streams stay up all the time and everyone can great, uh, produce great looking content. Um, Adam? Hello, my name's Adam Schneider. Uh, I was recently with Best Buy, uh, working as a technical director, running all of their live streaming for the enterprise. Um, uh, as of right now, I'm doing uh, freelance live stream production from end to end, pre-production, on site, and then post, usually um, assisting with the editors on getting the um, edited product to the client. Hello, my name is Victor Borchuk, and I am the director and executive producer at Jupiter Return. Um, basically got started uh, directing Tom Green's show, and then from there started Jupiter Return, which is basically a production company that's focusing um, basically on web-centric type of uh, productions and just kind of working on a very streamlined workflow and kind of evolving the production process as much as possible. I, I would say that Victor is like three production trucks and in, in one man <laughs> sometimes for some of his events. Um, I should also mention that uh, uh, Pete Scott was supposed to be on the panel, but he wasn't able to make it. Uh, I guess it's, he's not on there. Uh, so, so the first thing I thought we'd do is just dig in a little bit deeper, nitty gritty, and I asked these, the, the folks to kind of pick, a, there's not a typical event, but just kind of pick one event that they've worked on that, you know, talk about the workflow and how that happened in just kind of a couple minutes to just, just get in there. So you want to start? And I might have a sure. video. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think one of our, uh, probably about two months ago, we did a uh, live stream of an Alicia Keys concert live from the Beacon Theater. It was uh, in partnership with Vivo. 
And I think for, for us that kind of demonstrates probably the best we could possibly do as far as you know, redundancy and um, you know, really making sure we, we knew what we were doing. Um, so it was a, you know, a huge production uh, to Union House. Uh, sorry, sorry, I don't know what that was. That was uh, previewing <laughs> a clip. Didn't know it was, uh, it was live. Go ahead. But uh, so you know, we, we really you know, we had our hands in everything from making sure that the format was uh, you know, 1080p, 2398, which is not really standard for TV production, but for the web, it looks just perfect. Um, and so we, we really made sure that you know, our product coming out of our switcher was going to look great. And then we had to deal with the fact that you know, this was sponsored and this was with a new partnership. So it, there was no chance it could go, go down. So you know, we brought a satellite truck in. We sent satellite to uh, LA. And uh, we encoded from there as our primary. And we sent fiber back to our facility in New York where we uh, did the backup encoding, really just guaranteeing that there was no chance this was going to go down. Um, and you know, we, we recorded our VOD files in the truck there. We recorded them at each uh, transmission endpoint. And it, it really went, went seamless. And uh, I think as far as what we do, that kind of just demonstrates the, the best, the high end, the, you know, when you give us any budget, that's what we can do. But uh, I have a quick little video so you can just see kind of the other type of things that we do. So uh, you can see that really, no matter what your budget is, you can do something. Roll the tape. Let's see. And if I die tonight, well, I guess I die tonight. Let me go on. Okay, now we are live from <laughs> Cupertino, California. Hey, y'all, I'm Scotty McCreary, coming to y'all live from AOL Studios in New York City. Welcome, Martha. Thank you for and having me on the show. Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life. Welcome, everybody, to the Engadget <laughs> Show. We have a very Halloween-themed episode for you tonight. If it wasn't for science, right now those people wouldn't be listening to us. Mm. We wouldn't have this over. That's just an example of kind of the, the wide variety of uh, different kinds of production levels that, that we do. And all those were streamed live? Yeah, those were all, uh, all live using a variety of different technologies that we, uh, we do use. And there, there was one that looked like in front of Apple headquarters that was there? How, how did, how yeah, did you do that we, uh, we've recently started using a, a live UPAC a lot. And uh, you know, it, it's not perfect. It, it, sometimes the stream breaks. But you know, it, it's really cheap. And you can basically go anywhere with it. And, you know, a satellite truck might cost you 20 grand for the day. This will cost you, you know, two grand to rent for the week or, you know, two grand per month if you're going to, you know, sign one for a year. And you really can go anywhere with it. And we use it to send the signal back to our studio so that I can actually send it out of our Cisco media encoders. So, you know, you can still stream multi bit rate, iOS, uh, you know, you can really hit every rendition you need. And that, that uses the. Uh 3G or 4G network? Yeah, I think it's get out. 14 cell phones and a WiMAX modem. Right. It'll probably give you cancer. But. <laughs> uh, Alden, do you want to? Yeah, so um, one of the events that I thought of as an interesting example of sort of a live in the field, uh, live streaming production was we did a promotion with uh, Zynga last year for, uh, it was Snoop Dogg blowing up an armored truck in the middle of the desert in Vegas. And uh, it was pretty funny because uh, it was a good example of it. A lot of times when uh, we do events for marketing companies, they sort of have a little bit of budget left over and they say, well, let's do a live stream. And maybe no one really thinks about how much that entails or what they need to do. But we had a video producer that went out uh, with a live pack once again. And this time he was, uh, he was actually using a TriCaster to uh, take in the camera. So he had multiple cameras and then they were feeding into a live pack. And this was in the middle of the desert. Well, the first problem we had was that the uh, heat killed our first live pack, so I had to run to FedEx at uh, I don't know, 7.55 and make sure I could overnight another live pack <laughs> to uh, Vegas, and fortunately it got there. And then the other problem that we had was that there wasn't really any sort of director for the shoot, and there was all these people that had heard about it, and it ended up being uh, an incredibly successful promotion on uh, Zynga's part. Uh, and so there was, uh, there was multiple cameras there from different uh, news agencies and things. And then uh, no one realized that if you ever do an event with a rapper, they always show up 45 minutes late. So um, there was a stream that was scheduled to go on a certain time, and there was nothing happening. It was just a shot of a truck in the middle of the desert. 
And so finally, one of the guys from Zynga said, well, maybe I should get on the mic and just say something. So you had this guy who wasn't expecting to be on the mic. He just starts bullshitting in front of the mic for, I don't know, half an hour. And uh, meanwhile, this stream got to maybe 100,000 concurrent viewers, 200,000 concurrent viewers. And so we have a stream that uh, hits massive viewership, and it's just a guy who wasn't even expecting to be on the mic in the middle of the desert <laughs> trying to make up something about the truck. And uh, so finally Snoop shows up, and no one had given him any instructions on what to do, and so he's like, well, what should I do? I should I just press the button? And someone's like, well, maybe you should count. You should count, whatever. So by the time Snoop was there, it hit 350,000 concurrent viewers, all off a uh, TriCaster going to live pack in the middle of the desert. And uh, at the end, it was you know, one, of the, one of the highest live streams we had ever done, and it was a pretty, uh, pretty interesting production because uh, it was all you know, basically uh, happening off of just TriCaster live pack in the middle of the desert. And uh, you know, I think Zynga was very happy with it, and it was a great example of it was uh, if it had maybe been planned a little bit better and it had only been 10 minutes long uh, and Snoop had showed up on time, we probably never would have hit that viewership. Uh, and actually, him showing up 45 minutes late uh, was probably one of the best things that ever happened because uh, when it comes to live content, in order to promote it, it needs to be live and it needs to stay live for a long time. Because yes, Twitter is fast and Facebook's fast, but you know, it's not five minutes fast. You need you know, maybe half an hour, an hour to grow audience. So it was a very interesting example for me of how you, know, you could do a very low budget production and get a huge audience with the right uh, level of novelty and someone showing up 45 minutes late. So, so, so I think the lesson in that is be late. Right? Don't, don't, don't start on time necessarily. So. Believe it or not, it's actually, uh, it's actually something that I recommend to people now after seeing this happen on multiple events because uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with celebrity and you're trying to have the uh, social media aspect of it, you know, everybody always wants their events to go viral and grow a big audience. Uh, the big thing with live content is that if it happens very quickly, then no one has a chance to catch it because people don't show up on time. So uh, there's two tricks to growing a big audience for live content. One is make sure your live stream is super, super, super long and just have it go on for days. And the other one is to uh, have your main talent show up late. But um, uh, I see uh, Brian from NASA is here. And with the shuttle launch, unfortunately, uh, the shuttle launches cannot happen late. So we haven't been able to employ that trick there. But uh, they still managed to get pretty good viewership as well. Right. I mean, I, we, I, we do get requests that people want to do a 10-minute live stream in places. And it's, it's just, I think we up here know that that's just not, uh, you know, unless it's something huge, massive, to get people to tune in to something that's 10 minutes long is, is not going to happen. Uh, at, a, at, a, at a great number, uh, except except like, I think we were saying though that sometimes the, the the high stream things are fan related. Like I mean, you you had some example where where if, if, if with a rapper or with some of the some of the music folks, if there's a, a dedicated audience, they might tune in. But yeah, want... one trick that we've started doing is uh, basically you know recording something to a key pro, setting it to loop, and the moment it's done, just relooping it. And you know, Twitter will keep going. People they don't totally realize it's not live. You know, it's it's live enough for them. Um, but then you don't lose viewers in that period where they come back five minutes later and the VOD file isn't there. So it's just a little trick. Right. So if if the event's over and it's a slate or black, all these Twitters tweets are going to be going out pointing to the event. So to have something ready, watchable, right there makes makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, Adam, do you want? Uh, well, just to kind of piggyback on what they're saying, um, I always had issues with uh, people saying that they would have you know the internet line ready to go when I'd show up, and typically I'd show up and there would be no internet or it'd be very filtered and wouldn't allow for live streaming. And uh, one example of this was the Lady Gaga event we did. Uh, it was her CD release uh, inside of one of the Best Buy stores in New York, and uh, we showed up and they had this entire like wrought iron set built and this whole thing inside of the store. And we show up to live stream and we had done all the pre-work uh, under the impression that there was a T1 line in there and we showed up and it was a completely filtered secure network we couldn't get on so last minute we had to order a live pack and um, we managed to get it all working with our TriCaster but uh, you know it was interesting because she showed up 45 minutes late around 30 to 45 minutes late and we just we just shot the blank stage and had some people walking in and and uh, saying a few things in front of the camera and it, it seemed to build the audience really well I think we had uh, before the show even started, I think we had like 50,000 concurrents, and then during it was 80 to 100,000, you know, back and forth. But um, again, it turned out to be a really successful event just because it was so, I think one of the allure 
the biggest allure of live streaming is that it's live and it's kind of uncensored in, in a way. Like, you know, it's, if it's a blank stage, you're kind of seeing what's going on and you're seeing the mistakes that people can make. I think it's um, one of the more interesting parts of live streaming as opposed to just watching video on demand is that you're getting that raw, uncensored version. So that was a really success successful event for us. That's good, I think. I think probably, I mean, we've done a ton of crazy events, like anything from, you know, a seven camera HD shoot on like Richard Branson's Island to, you know, things like all over the place. But, you know, one of the things that kind of always remains true is that people always expect the same production value that they get from like a 40 person TV crew, but they hire like two people to come out and then it's like, you know, <laughs> so you have to make that work because you can't tell them, well, we can't do this. Um, and so the, really the key to all of that and the reason that we're able to make events like that shoot on, on the island work is you have to keep everything as streamlined as possible. And it's like if you overcomplicate things and you bring like this kind of setup that isn't really fully baked and it's based off of more of a television, like an antiquated model like that, you're going to run into a problem where the show is going to be super minimal and it's going to cost a ton of money and the client's going to be like kind of pissed at the end of it. And a really good example of... Um, how we were able to make that work is we did an MTV shoot last uh, Thursday for uh, Twilight Breaking Dawn. It was an MTV first. And typically on those shoots, like, we'll show up at 8, and then the, the actual shoot will air around 2 or 3 p.m. This one, they were doing a handprint ceremony at the Chinese. And so the actual portion that we were shooting was 10 a.m. And so we set up a three-camera shoot with, you know, a jib, two camera operators, audio, you know, PA sound, uh, you know, mon like basically we brought in the whole studio and set it up inside the Chinese Six. And we had that done in an hour and a half. Um, and so, you know, when it aired, it ended up being the highest viewed MTV News uh, live stream in history. Um, and had we done that with like a kind of a model where we rolled in a truck and all this stuff, like it probably wouldn't have happened because it would have been like 20 dudes like standing around, like not really doing anything and kind of like wasting a lot of time and it would have been three o'clock and nothing would have gotten done. But the way that we did it, we kind of scaled it down to like exactly what we needed, had a little bit of redundancy, enough, you know, enough to make sure that everything went off perfectly. And we got there, like zip, 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 it was done, like on the air, everybody was super calm. It's like we were in and out and as if nothing ever happened. And so this is kind of a short clip from that. Okay, oops. Got to get the keyboard off. That was the very first one. That was the first Twilight set interview that we did with you guys. Yeah, yeah. that was someone else, though. It was by Ari. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that was, was that was very different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how to take that. <laughs> no, I love you guys. I think it was a we've had a lot of we've had a very a lot of we've had good development. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. Our our, our relationships have really progressed. It's true. And, and by the end of this first, I don't know, we're gonna either never speak to each other again, or it's just gonna go to the next level. Um, okay, so. So just a little kind of taste of what that would what that looked like. Yeah, I mean that that certainly didn't look like uh, got there an hour before the the shoot started. Yeah, uh, I mean it's uh, you know it was the fastest we've ever set one of those up. So, right. um, so so I think you know I think we we talked about I mean people talked about using mobile live packs a little bit to do streams and sometimes for a high end client we we've used fiber or satellites but I think most of the time people are trying to do it off an of internet connection. So I'm just kind of wondering maybe a group here weigh in on you know what, what connection do you need? That's that's like one of the key things that you probably think of first. I mean, I, I think we, we chatted a little before and there were two. It's like, what's your budget for the event? And that there's, then you pick which tool, which tool you pull out of your pocket to, to make it work, but then what's the bandwidth at the event? So what, what, what would you guys want to have bandwidth at an event if you're, if you're streaming it, you know, you're not using fiber or mobile live pack? Does you want to weigh in? With? I, would, I would say, start, for starters, uh, the biggest you know, thing is um, the uplink speed, and that's something that not a lot of people think about. Um, you know, when you get like a cable internet modem, uh, you know, a lot of times, even if it's business class modem, you'll get 50 megabits down, but it'll only give you like one megabit up. And people just don't realize that when they decide to do a live stream, like, oh, we have plenty of bandwidth, and you're like, well, let me come out and test it. They're like, no, really, we got it. And then you show up, and it's like, you know, 700 kilobits up. So. First things first, you have to find out what the internet connection is. If it's you know if it's a T1 line, if it's filtered, um, if it's secure network that they're using for other things, if it's dedicated. So if you're going to be the only one using it for the event, or if they're deciding for this event that they have maybe they do have you know uh, 20 megabits or five megabits up and 20 down, but they're still going to be using it for client um, like tablet activations or whatever, then you're like, well, we can't use it either because you never know what what kind of bandwidth you're going to get for your stream. So 
I would say for starters, a dedicated, what, four megabits up at least, and then 20 megabits down would be a good starting point yeah, for I a mean, good solid stream. I think, you know, it, it, it also it depends on, you know, the kind of shoot. I mean, if you're doing a shoot where the client wants, you know, multiple bit rates and, you know, they want to encode one HD stream and several SD streams, then, you know, that's obviously going to push your bandwidth needs up a lot. But, I mean, you know, in reality, I mean, we do, I mean, tons of streams a, a year. And, you know, for most of them, it's like, you know, single bit rate. Generally, it's going to be like pretty standard, like you know, your 640 by 360, something like that, you know, for most players. So, I mean, for there, like you kind of, you know, for the most part, you kind of want to ask for a little bit more than you need, but you don't want to ask for enough to like freak out the client. I mean, if you go and you ask them for 10 megs up, then it's like it could get canceled, you know what I mean? Because they're going to be like, we can't do that. But if you ask them for maybe two, then that's very doable. You'll probably end up with like 1.5, and on 1.5, you can do a single bit rate stream without a problem, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, and one thing that I think a lot of people are starting to utilize more is like the wows in the clouds. Uh, you know, I know like Ustream, Livestream, they have that built in where you send them one stream, they make everything off of that, uh, and then you can get away with less. Um, but I know like for, for us, we, we don't use that. Um, so we basically normally use Cisco encoders. Um, you know, we send all of our bit rates out. So a normal, like a high-end event, I'll have six HLS uh, streams and you know maybe four RTMP each. So the total per just the primaries is probably about 10 megs. Uh, throw in a backup, that's 20 megs. Um, and so you know that's what I, I would ask for. But then you know on the other end, like I, I do an event out of uh, Marlo Thomas's apartment, and she refuses to get better internet. She refuses to let me bring in a live view pack because it's just different and it's scary. So, you know, I, I make do. I send a 300K stream. It doesn't look great, but, you know, it's there. People can watch it. They're happy at the end of the day. I think, so, we're, I think we were talking a little more, maybe expand on that, that uh, it, it's like, what's your pain point? Like, I, so some shows, there are some shows that we do where the sponsor is, is, you know, it's a major brand name thing, and it can't go down for a second. It's like a broadcast event. But then there's other shows which may not have all that behind it, where if, if you're up for eight hours on a stream and maybe it reboots or lost a little, it's not going to be the... It's not going to be the end of things. So, is, is there, you know, do you weigh, weigh the budget and the, the pain factor? Yeah, in doing I, mean, I think you definitely, that's kind of the first thing. It's what is the, basically, like, is this sponsored? Are we going to lose ad dollars if this stream goes down? Uh, and how much money are you willing, willing to spend for it? Because obviously, you know, fiber is going to be more reliable than a live U pack, but it's a lot more expensive. Um, and so, it's kind of always just explaining these trade offs and, you know, saying basically, if there's an internet connection, we can do something. You know, something can happen. But it may not look pretty, and you just have to be willing to uh, to make those sacrifices. Mm -hmm. We have a we have two big issues when it comes to bandwidth, and one is that people would rather believe what someone told them the bandwidth is rather than just seeing what the bandwidth actually is at the moment they want to stream. So they'll say, no, the guy promised me that I have five megabits up. And I'm like, I don't care what the guy said. What, what does your speed test say? And they do a speed test and they say, oh, that must be wrong. Well, no, I'm sorry. It's, you know, the speed test is right and the guy is wrong. Or, you know, your, your provider promised you the maximum that's possible, but that's not what you're actually getting. So we have that as a big issue. The other big issue is people don't understand the majority of encoders are using variable bitrate. And variable bitrate can have major, major swings, especially if you use an encoder where if you do specific settings on it, the swings can be almost uncapped. And so uh, sometimes we've had people that say, well, I'm only doing an 800K stream, and I have a 5 megabit up connection, and I know it's 5 megabits up. And they don't realize that you could still, if, if you're on a microwave 5 megabit connection, you have any dip in your bandwidth, and then you have any swing on your encoder, you could still easily exceed your bandwidth. And so it's really important to understand basically what is your actual bandwidth, make sure it's not fluctuating, and do multiple speed tests to see, you know, basically is your bandwidth staying consistent, know if there's other people on it, and then also to understand the realities of what encoder you're using and how much does it swing and are there settings in it to control the swing of your uh, variable bitrate.
Uh, maybe this is obvious. It's, it's obvious to all of us, and maybe it is to everyone in the room, but uh, I, w I would say speedtest.net is, is your friend. I mean, I, I think that's, uh, if you want to get your up, you know, your up and down speed and try different uh, stuff, speedtest.net. And I don't know if you, anyone uses other things. Yeah, I think but, you okay. also, though, need or to. Ping, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think you also need to do, do some ping tests because you can have, you know, lots of bandwidth, but if your latency is way up there, you're going to lose a ton of packets. and. Uh, you know, it's not going to look pretty on the on the other end. Right, right. Uh, let, let me talk a little. So we've talked about the transmission side of it, and the other part is the production side. So I think you know some some video production events are one camera, some are a prosumer or something or other, some are three cameras and a switcher. So what? Describe a little bit about the the range of uh, like you know are, are you using. Swi uh, a hardwired switcher, a TriCaster, a Wirecast, or what, you know, how, what, a single camera. Give me a little bit about maybe Victor start of the I range mean, of options you think about. We typically end up using TriCaster for the majority of shoots. Um, there's times when you do, particularly events that are with like you know a network or something like that. Sometimes they'll want to steer you toward more of like a, like a Panasonic or something like that. But at the end of the day, it's kind of the same thing. We, just, we, we use TriCaster because it offers kind of the most functionality in a, in a small space. Um, but to me, you know, there's a lot of like, I, I've worked with people that like always try to like push like something like a Wirecast or something like that. And that works really good for like, you know, single camera type of setup and things like that. But there's, you run into so many problems whenever you try to make like a multi-camera multi show or like a TriCaster type of show out of something like Wirecast or some other type of like software like that. Um, I mean, for the most part, like when you're doing something that you, you want to have like all those different types of like feeds coming in, whether it's like, you know, PCs and things like that, you have to go with something that gives you kind of like a hardware surface to plug everything into or else it's, you're going to see the, the kind of effects of that in the, in the finished product. So. Anyone else? Or? I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think he said everything. <laughs> Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit more. So, so I think also people think about the live event, and they sometimes only think about the live event when it's on. But then, and the archives are the afterthought. And sometimes, I mean, you know, a live event, you, you never know what's going to happen. And so, you know, some events work great as live, and they're they're lousy as the archive. But there's many events that that work good live, and maybe you, you get even more audience watching the archive. So, kind of, where does you know, where does the archiving workflow fit into the events that you guys do? Is that um, uh, wait, wait, how do you think about the archives? Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think you. That's kind of a main thing. You have to think about that because. Uh, you know, the moment the stream goes down, that's what you have uh, when it's over. We, as I said before, we generally we loop everything on a key pro, so we always try to you know record to a key pro in camera, and then uh, if it's in the studio, we have uh, pipelines, and so we'll record live to our SAN as it's happening, and uh, it's actually really cool. Editors can edit it while it's actually happening live, so we can start to turn around clips uh, as an event is actually happening, which is uh, you know just really helpful so that. The moment it's done, there's you know the little highlight clips, and then you still have the loop. So there's just that much more for people to view. But I, I think it's really important that when you think of the live stream, you also think of how you're going to capture it, um, because no matter what in your you know your, if it's an SDI workflow, it's a, if it's a FireWire workflow, somewhere you have to be recording that, and where you're taking your live stream from is going to be one of those paths. So I think it's just really important that you know the same people who are doing the live stream are also you know talking to whoever's setting up the production, if it's a different, uh, you know, different person, and making sure that everyone's just on the same page with, with that. Do you, do you, anyone else want to weigh in on the archiving part? Uh, I think you know, one, one of the best things about uh, um, archiving is like, a lot of the abilities that you have to archive things live. Um, and Ustream, in particular, has a, great, um, has a great platform for that that we use during uh, the Disrupt in San Francisco, where you know, as you're going along, instead of waiting until the end of the event, which you know, a lot of, we'll typically loop events as well after, afterwards, just to kind of get the people that were late to the event to see it live, uh, or kind of live. Um, but you know, what you can do is you can actually clip off that event as you're going along. So instead of waiting till the end and then having to sit there and post and you know, edit everything and then upload it, which you know, then you're kind of missing out a little bit on that, like, you know, how newsworthy it is. You can kind of clip it off live, and then you still have the ability to kind of, like, send it wherever you need to go because those clips are already being archived. So, I mean, when the event's done, you're basically done with it, close the book, you can move on to the next thing. It's already where it needs to be. 
Yeah, that's one thing that, uh, uh, so I actually worked with John on, uh, we were doing a TechCrunch's conference in New York and in San Francisco, and uh, one thing that happens at this conference is that someone might say something newsworthy and they want to get the clip up right away. Um, or uh, we worked on the uh, Le Web conference, which was in France, and uh, they, they had the CEO from PayPal on stage, and it was right around the time that PayPal had cut off WikiLeaks. And he made some, some comment about WikiLeaks that everyone thought was a big deal. And so, uh, you know, if something just happened on the live stream, you can't get that archive up fast enough. And one thing that uh, you can take advantage of is that if you're already encoding to H.264 AAC at a certain bit rate that's sort of a web-friendly playback format, uh, if you can basically figure out a way to take these same clips that you just encoded for live and get them immediately turned into VOD, and in some cases, for this conference, for example, we were doing, there was a hundred one-minute presentations. And so you don't have time to, you don't have time to clip heads and tails. You don't have time to re-encode these, reconvert these, because, uh, you know, you would need a staff of several people just to, like, you know, physically manage that many clips. So uh, we were trying to do it in a real-time workflow so that basically, as it was live, we were just hitting start and stop. And then all those clips could uh, get up within minutes rather than getting up within hours. And when it's newsworthy content, that's really important. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, archiving. You know, we, uh, at these events that we do, we have many different panels, and uh, we're going to write. TechCrunch is going to write an article about almost every single panel. And the writers, you know, it's pretty fast for them. They they maybe even know a little bit about what's going to be said ahead of time. And they, you know, by the time the event is over they're ready to go on their text posts because that's a bit easier, not always, but, um, and you know, they, want, they want the video in there like two seconds after the, 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 the panel is over. And you know, I, I, sometimes there's a mindset of, oh, well, we could get it ready in like two or three days later, but that's, that's like way too late. So we, we, uh, we try to you know, come up with ways where doing it in real time or you know, to have the archives uh, ready on the spot, which is, uh, the, the only other, uh, and we'll open it up to questions in, in a couple minutes here, but I, I, I did also want to throw out that we, I think a lot of us have done experience with those live view or similar technology where one is a backpack that you can go on, and I think there's a new one that's going to be like a size of a, a small box, I guess, that fits on the camera, and just share, uh, share using, using those things, because then, then you don't even need the wired inter internet connection, then you just need a little bit of uh, cell phone bandwidth, and you know, I, think, I think it's just fascinating to some of us what, what you can do without even a connection, so I think, I think you guys have used that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the live view packs are, are great, and for the longest time, they're kind of the only person in that space, um, and there's been a lot of shows where, you know, talking about connectivity, we've, you know, been assured of, you know, you have 1.5 up, 2 up, and then you show up and you end up doing the show on the live view as, as you know, using that as your encoder and your uplink. Um, so, I mean, that's definitely something that works really good. The latency, you know, you do see a little bit of delay there. Um, but, you know, like if you went to NAB a couple years ago, that was like the only thing around. If you went to NAB this past year, there was like, you know, probably 20 people doing the same thing. And a lot of the packs are, uh, are really small too. Like there's, I mean, like Mushroom Networks, there's a bunch of different places. And they're making, they have packs now where it's kind of the all-in-one thing where it's a backpack set up where you can plug a camera into it. And then there's other ones that just work strictly as an uplink. So it's like the box is maybe like the size of this pad of paper. And you just basically, you know, plug a Cat5 in there. It works the same way. You have, you know, six cell phone cards. And it, you know, still does all the bonding and everything like that. But it just, instead of going Firewire and having to have a converter and all that, you can just go straight in Cat5. So. Yeah, they're just, they just, uh, I think Livey just is starting work on the Live U, LU40i pack, I believe it's called. It's like yeah. this, it's about the size of, you know, like, like this big. <laughs> and uh, it's the same thing. It's just smaller. But I, from what I've heard, it's, I don't know if it's HD compatible, but yeah, the, the technology is amazing that they're able to just use those cell phone links to broadcast. I, think, I still think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. We've used them for a lot of uh, pretty awesome events that you know, definitely wouldn't have happened without them. And the, one, uh, the only uh, catch for them is that sometimes you have situations where the cell phone networks are completely clogged. Um, our office is right near where the uh, San Francisco Giants won the World Series. And I'll tell you, you couldn't send a text message anywhere in that neighborhood uh, when the game was going on. And so the, pro the only problem is that sometimes you have these big events where there's a lot of people there where someone's like, oh, take a live pack down there and go shoot it. It'd be awesome. Yeah, well, you're not going to get any signal in those situations. So um, 
uh, that's the one, that's the only catch that, you know, we've experienced with uh, something like that, um, is that relying on the cell phone networks can certainly be tough when the cell phone networks themselves are just so clogged that um, you can't use them. I, th I think people almost, you know, because they see these technologies, they almost think, oh, of course you can live stream uh, from, from anywhere. Uh, and, and we, like at uh, CES, I, I couldn't even make a phone call because the, the, the phone networks weren't working. My phone didn't work. The text barely did. But because I guess these mobile, some of these mobile app packs have multiple modems in it and they're trying to connect on all the different networks, uh, it was able to mostly get out a stream. I mean, I think you've you got to understand that it's, it's going to stop and there's probably nothing you can do about it. I mean, it's, if, if, if the bandwidth uh, goes, you know, it, it, it rides up and down constantly, and sometimes it's just going to freeze or buffer if you're in a, a difficult situation, and there's, there's probably nothing you're going to be able to, to do to solve that sometimes. But I think, I think we, we got about 10 minutes left, and they said that we'd try to do some Q&A. I, mean, I have some other questions, but let's try some Q&A. And if you have, a, if you want to direct it at a person, do that, or else I will. So go ahead. Oh, and actually, we should have a mic. Let's, let's uh, have you talking to the mic so everyone hears. Oops. Oof. <laughs> we almost lost Eric over there. Okay. Uh, right in the front. Hi. Uh, I work with NASA. I know Brian. <laughs> and uh, I do everything you guys do, okay? I'm a broadcast engineer, and I've got to go out, and I've got to set it up, and I've got to do it, okay? And I have a question. So, uh, so I'm going to try to save a little money, okay? So instead of renting a satellite truck or doing dry fiber, which I've done many times, okay? I want to use the general internet, which means I'm going to do what you guys are trying to do, okay? So what I need to know is, do any of you guys know how difficult it is to call an ISP, the local ISP at the venue, and go, look, I need a VPC and I need 10 megabits or I need 50 megabits. What's the time frame for that? Do you guys have any kind of experience with that? So if I got some money, and I, it's going to be hopefully less than satellite or fiber. I need to talk to the ISP, I need a VPC, and I need it at this venue. Can you help me? So you guys know anything about that? We've looked into that before. That's why we've like, ended up normally going fiber, because it can often be you know, 60 days, and if you want it faster, there's a big rush fee, and it can end up being longer. And that's in New York. So I, 60 days? Uh, I know the one or two times where we've priced it out, it's, it's been 60 days. 60 days. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's New York City, so it may be different uh, yeah. down there. Yeah. I mean, we've yeah, typically 60 days of provisioning times is, is pretty standard when you go like through telco. Um, I mean, depending on the area too, there's uh, there's always the option of going kind of point to point. I mean, there's places like Tower Stream and COVID that can do point to point connections like that, and those are usually pretty scalable. So, I mean, if you're in a in a place where they can hit it from a, one of their towers or something like that, that's an option. And those, I think Tower Stream is, I want to say like they can have a connection up within 48 hours. So like at the Chinese theater, for example, we set a connection up there for a stream that we had to have on, we were doing the show on Friday and they came, we called them on Monday and by like Wednesday it was ready to go. So. Why don't you talk, I'm in a, okay, let's, uh, I'll, another question then. I'm in a venue, like here, okay, and they got nominal internet, okay, you know, 10 down, one out or something like that. I need a bump up for my uh, upload to 10 megabits or something like that, so I get a, a pretty good looking picture for right. HD, 720p. Do you guys know how difficult that is to do, just to get a bump up? I'm not sure. It all depends on, it's, it all depends depends on the venue, the, the provider. Yeah. Yeah, for the venue. Also, I think that they always, it always depends on like if they have that capability with, with the line they've already dropped. Like they may say that, that it's already beyond, you know, it's already at its limit. So <laughs> you're unlucky on that. Situation. I mean, I, I think some venues maybe have, it's easier than others for sure. Yeah. I, I will say in, in China we had that problem that we were not getting enough and we needed more. And we were not, there was no way in 24 hours to get the bump up. That just, so, so we wound up not letting the audience have much bandwidth and stole it for a stream. I think some, someone else had a question. Uh, uh, well, go ahead. Okay. What, what percentage of business class productions, I know Hollywood's one thing, you get satellite trucks, but a business class, if they came to you and said, we want to broadcast this live from this venue, how many times would you use what's existing and just make it work versus try to bring some other bandwidth source in? Anybody can answer. Um, I was going to say, I think it depends a lot on, on their budget, you know, and, and that's, that's always the hardest thing is that we've done productions for huge corporations with tons of money, but the problem is that for the specific production they were doing, it was coming out of someone's marketing budget. And so it's only, you know, they say we can only spend $10,000 or $20,000 and they don't have enough. So 
Um, I think it's, it's really dependent on the budget, I would say. I think it's really important that, and so this is something I struggle with still, is that making the live stream portion of the, the show, um, building that into the event platform, like when they're in the room talking about how they're going to do this event and everything, making the live stream part of that discussion as opposed to an afterthought and making it more budget oriented so that you get the budget that you need to get the production you want um, and making it more of an interactive experience and more of a rich experience than just kind of like a third party watching whatever show is going on. And I think that um, for business class productions, I think that's really important to let everybody know at the table that's making those decisions, this is what we should do for live streaming if this is what you want to do. Otherwise, we can do it, there's no problem, but you know, you may run into, you may not get what you want out of it. So As used internet line, um, I mean, it always it varies. I'd say maybe what like thirty percent of the time I can use it, and and I always have to specify that like nobody else can use the line. So I'll usually call the house technician and make sure that he's able to like lock it down for me or something. But I typically I I don't. It's hard to trust that, especially if you're doing a big, big production and you're the point guy. It's really it's tough to be like, oh yeah, the IT guy said it was fine. I'd say forty to fifty percent of the time. And then percentage? Relative? Yeah, I mean, I would say I would say probably 50 or so. Okay, I think we got maybe one or two. Just uh, any, I think there were some other hands. Uh, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm just wondering if any of you have had experience, uh, successful experience with ad insertion or replacement through a live stream, and if so, um, what you did to make that successful. Um, Maybe Alden wants to. Um, so we uh, on our platform, you know, we have our own we have our own ad server, which uh, we've you know we've certainly swapped uh, pre rolls and mid rolls and things like that, and you know, in the middle of the live stream. I'm not sure uh, specifically. We don't we don't really do it on the uh, encoder level. Um, we're not, and we have a lot of uh, TV networks that are very interested for us to do that. We don't offer that at the time. So um, most of this the ad serving that we do is uh, with our own ad server where people give us you know, an ad tag and we run it like that. I think the ad piece, we, we, I'm glad you brought that up because I think the ad part of it is, does clearly weigh into all our productions of whether it's a pre-roll or how we're doing it, is, is, is that? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we use Freewheel now and so uh, for certain of our shows, yeah, there's uh, it's sponsored by Sprint, the Sprint you know, ad has to, has to happen and so just it's kind of well we make the player, um, we use uh, our own custom Brightcove player just in the XML that we upload, have to make sure that all the metadata does actually, you know, match um, the right asset. So it's just kind of some more internal communication that, that needs to happen on our end. Mm -hmm. But it, it does wind up on the streaming producer to make the ad side of it happen. In my better exactly. Ones, you know, uh, w one more quick one, and then I think that's it. Or maybe there's not anyone. No. Go ahead. Last. Uh, is everyone on the end over there? Hey, a couple of you guys mentioned you guys use the TriCaster. Do you guys have any experience putting captions through the TriCaster or no? Captions like subtitles cap or yeah, something or, or, or name graphics? What? Uh, like either closed captions or open captions or any, any kind. I, 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 I haven't. Mean, we're uh, not doing that or we have, I, I haven't really done that yet. No, but there's someone from TriCaster here that I'm sure you could talk to about <laughs> it. So. Yeah, I haven't, yeah, I haven't done that. Okay, well, I think, I think we're out of time, but I want to thank everyone for coming and hope you learned something. And uh, have a good day. Thank you to my panelists.